So in the summer of 2020, something really bad happened in my life. And as has become tradition, when something really bad happens in my short life, I turn to media to escape it. It's the only thing that drowns out the panic in my brain or fills up the emptiness of depressive episodes. So in this situation, I believed it would help too. I mean, it had never failed me before. And then it did. I spent four long days barely sleeping, panicking over everything, and nothing could drown out my screaming brain. Not comfort shows, not new shows, not music, not video games, nothing. Which was when my mother suggested trying something different. Watch something in another language. Something that forces you to pay attention to the screen or risk having no idea what's going on. Something that has to captivate my attention entirely so my brain doesn't have any energy left to scream at me. So I opened Netflix and I scrolled to the first foreign thing I saw. A cheesy K-drama from 2016 called Cinderella and the Four Knights. And it worked. So naturally, when it was over, I followed the suggestions to the next K-drama. And the next. And the next. And by the time the bad spell was over, including two weeks of severe anxiety followed by a month-long depressive episode where I felt absolutely nothing unless I was staring at the screen watching fictional people interact, I had watched 67 K-dramas in six weeks. That's roughly one and a half a day. K-dramas are usually single-run series of roughly hour-long episodes, sometimes from 12 to 20, but usually at a standard 16 episodes. 16 hours of content per series. In those six weeks, I woke up, turned on a K-drama, watched it through, started another, and either watched it until completion or until sleep overtook me. Rinse and repeat. I watched so many, I started picking up pieces of the language by osmosis. It's been over a year since then. Over 18 months, in fact. And since then, I have seen over 300 K-dramas, films, and miniseries. 57 Thai dramas, and 84 dramas and films combined from other nationalities. Japan, Taiwan, Hong Kong, the Philippines, Vietnam. My to watch list is approaching 200 titles. Insane considering how many I've already seen and how many I started with so many months ago. My simple list of 20k dramas to watch as a coping mechanism has become a huge part of my life and in many ways has changed me fundamentally as a person. Without these k dramas I wouldn't have made it through those six weeks alive but more than that, I wouldn't have finished my third year uni poetry assignment, which revolved around the research I'd done on K-pop, which I would never have done without first getting into K-dramas. A poetry assignment that I'm so proud of I'm trying to have it published. I wouldn't have started learning the language. I wouldn't have discovered BLs, which is gay content coming primarily out of Asia, that is entirely devoted to gay romances, and now makes up conservatively 40% of my entire personality. I wouldn't have gotten into K-pop, which has its ups and downs, and I've definitely got another video coming up about that, but I digress. So I've organised my thoughts into a handy dandy number list, because this is YouTube, and also, as we all know, I fucking love a list. But also, this is over 18 months worth of content and opinions being disseminated into one video, so I really need to number those thoughts if I want to sound even a little bit coherent. So, here's some things I learned watching over 300 K-dramas. Number one. Fictional Korean men can get it. Now to be clear, I'm not talking about the actors playing them because I'm doing my utmost to avoid having parasocial relationships with real people that I don't know. The fictional characters they play, however. Also, obviously the actors are all very pretty. Multiple times watching these dramas, I have uttered the phrase, I'm asexual, but at what cost? So that probably gives you an idea of where I'm at emotionally. Beyond K-dramas, one of my favorite genres of content is period dramas, because I was a Shakespeare and Jane Austen nerd throughout my entire childhood and teen years, and that shaped the person I grew up into. Basically, I'm a fucking delight, is what I'm saying. But part of why period romances in particular were my favorite is that for an undiagnosed asexual, <laughs> Can I say that? For an as yet out of the closet, even to herself, asexual, <laughs> those romances were more appealing to me than your run of the mill modern rom com. I never got the whole love at first sight thing. I never understood why in so many rom coms the main lead spent half of their time being insanely incompatible and then fix it with a grand romantic gesture. Which I fucking hate, by the way. Nothing would make me dump you faster than doing a flash mob proposal or giving a speech in front of all of my colleagues. That's not romantic. That's terrifying. And I'm not saying that K dramas don't have shows like these as well. They exist. But so many male leads in K-dramas, and the second leads as well, which is a whole other thing that I will probably get to make a video about at some point, are just nice men. At least in the last decade, that's become a growing trend anyway. Which feels like an incredibly low bar, but my god is it nice to see. I won't get too much into this because I've got a whole video coming out about it, but male leads in K-dramas are so sexy. Partly because culturally they tend to be more outwardly chivalrous, partly because a lot of them are written by women, and partly because a lot of them are unintentionally written to be bisexual. Again, I have a video on this coming, we'll get to it. But their love stories of the female leads rarely feel as rushed as in American or British content. I'm bisexual, or rather biromantic, but oftentimes I will swim wildly between imposter syndrome on either side, either wondering if I'm secretly straight or secretly gay, because people on either side insist that must be the case, and sometimes you let the imposter syndrome get to you. But there's something about male leads in K-dramas that meant even when I was only female 
feeling attraction to men. I never mistook that for heterosexuality. And that's something I'm going to explore more later, uh, but I really want to touch on it now because it's important to me that you all know how hot these men are. So basically, my journey through COVID has been realizing that despite my asexuality, I would still fuck any sexy fictional man that exists. And you may quote me on that. If you want a good romance drama with a perfect male lead, I'd recommend Run On, a pretty straightforward romance about a runner and a translator where everyone is either queer or neurodivergent in some way, uh, and the dialogue is fantastic. Or It's Okay to Not Be Okay, a man who works in a mental health facility meets a woman who's basically a sociopath, really cool vibes, I'd like her to step on me, and he seems lovely. Or Strong Woman Do Bong Soon, woman with secret super strength gets hired by a rich tech CEO to be her bodyguard when he sees her beat a bunch of thugs up and immediately starts simping for her. All those men drank giant vats of respect women juice, and their love interests are all badass bitches. Speaking of women, too, K-dramas relationships with women is complicated. Ah, oh, misogyny. You're inescapable. Korean misogyny is a lot like Western misogyny. When saying Western in this case, I mean specifically geologically West, because there's really no defined difference between the term Western in reference to American and British imperialism and the other side, except that people of colour exist on the other side. Korea, under the widely used definition of Western society, would fit right in. It's still a capitalistic hellscape, as most countries are, and that's what the West is defined by. So I'm not using it in that reductive way. I mean specifically America and the UK and the media and image and societal expectations of those countries that has largely defined the quote-unquote Western culture. Korea is still a country defined by class and capitalism and sexism. Women are sexually harassed, treated as inferior, and generally have a harder time than men. In dramas, this manifested for years as women being written as submissive wet blankets, or being treated badly by male leads and then ending up with them anyway, or if they did have a personality and opinions of their own, then they were villainized for it. Again, much like Western media. But over the last 10 years or so, women in K-dramas have evolved into some of the most interesting and dynamic female characters the world over. Let's not say there aren't a few duds every now and then, I'm looking directly at you, Birth of a Beauty, but for the most part they're fantastic. They're complex and funny and they make mistakes and they learn from them, and characters who would have been obvious villains a few years ago, like Komen Young from It's Okay Not To Be Okay. <laughs> And now they're romantic female leads, and I personally think that's fantastic! If you'd like a more elaborate breakdown of K-drama's approach to women, let me know, because it definitely feels like something that I could talk for hours about, but for now I'd just like to recommend Walk of Love, a rom-com in which the female lead is frequently making mistakes and also befriends a bunch of gangsters and helps them run their restaurant, Law School, in which every character is amazing, but especially the women and the plot lines and the way women are treated, <laughs> And a weightlifting fairy Kim Bok Ju, about a female weightlifter who I'm in love with and whose friends are equally lovable. Number three, cultural differences. Obviously, being a different culture, K dramas involve a lot of cultural differences. Sometimes entire plots revolve around these, in particular to do with relationships and family dynamics, like how living at home with your parents into your 30s is seen as a very normal thing. There are dramas where the character trying to move out early is an entire plot point that causes rifts. My Father is Strange is one example, where their oldest daughter moves in with her boyfriend in secret despite being a whole ass adult, because her parents will freak out if she moves in with him when they're not married. There is a sort of puritanical approach to sex, related to the way women are viewed, yay misogyny! And again, not entirely dissimilar to the way Western women are viewed, sex before marriage is pretty frowned upon, and there are a bunch of recent K-dramas that try to examine this and move away from it. On the flip side, in K-dramas, it's a lot more mainstream for characters to be virgins, including men, which is actually kind of a great thing. It's nice, especially as an asexual, to see a culture that doesn't put insane pressure on people to lose their virginity as soon as possible, as opposed to Western media, where there's an entire genre of watching comedy about teenage boys trying to lose their virginity as soon as possible so they don't become the severe embarrassment of being a 17-year-old virgin. You know, like American Pie and Skins, etc, etc. Now maybe outside of K-dramas there's a lot more of this pressure in like South Korean culture, but at least in most of the media I've seen it's basically non-existent. It also leads to some weird choices regarding romantic plot lines. Among K-drama watchers, a common term used is dead fish kiss, because of how frequently the kisses are like 1940s classic Hollywood kisses, where either they angle the camera so you can't even see the lips touch, or they do touch but neither of them move, so it's just a really long drawn out shot of two people with their lips pressed together, hence dead fish kiss. In my experience this is a lot worse in Chinese dramas, which also do a thing where the woman is completely still and the man is making out with her closed unmoving lips, which is just, oh my god, so much worse. I feel like, I feel like the way I have, I've gone overboard in describing it makes it sound like I'm exaggerating. I'm absolutely not. Girl, why aren't you doing anything? What is happening? The thing.
again, that's their first kiss. So that's what I thought it was. So, but then in the next episode, there's another kissing scene and it's the same shit. So I was like, okay, this is just weird. So I skipped to the last episode where they're like married and it's the same. And I was like, girl, you're married. You never learned how to kiss this man. <laughs> Ah, like I am asexual and if I was in love with someone and they wanted to kiss me, I would still, I would not fucking, st I would either, I would either accept or refuse. You don't just, you're like, yeah, I guess because you love me, I'll let you kiss me and then don't do anything. I'm so, huh? <laughs> I'm like having a crisis over this because why? <laughs> Leah, they are married. <laughs> Leah, they're married. <laughs> this couple is married. What the fuck? Anyway, this isn't about sea dramas. Not yet, anyway. If you fancy hearing my thoughts on those, do let me know. I'm gonna bring the kisses and care dramas back up in a few points time, so I'll circle back to this point. Something else that's a little different is the cultural approach to advertising and product placement. It seems a mark of respectability for a K-drama actor or K-pop idol to be a brand ambassador or rep for a lot of brands. Over here, I feel like it seems more of like a sellout type thing. Or in the case of YouTubers, knowing that they're just trying to get that bag. Or with huge celebrities, just kind of seen as ubiquitous. Because, of course, they're in that Rimmel ad. Why wouldn't they be? It's also a lot more common for the product placement in K-dramas to be more obvious. Subway, for example, sponsors loads of dramas. So there can and will be entire scenes set in Subways talking about the sandwich orders that are barely worked into the plot. This only gets worse when you dive into Thai dramas. But again, I have... Too many thoughts about those, and this essay is about K-dramas. The other major cultural difference is to do with the way language is used, particularly in conjunction with the class system, which I have so much to say about that it actually needs its own point. Number four, the class system. South Korea's class system is pretty rigid. The main example I use to explain to people over here is sort of like Regency England. The wealthier people are more stringently separated from the poorer people, and people don't call each other by their first names unless they know them very well. Often, they'll either use their full name followed by she, which is like saying, you know, Mr. Fitzwilliam Darcy, rather than just... Fitzwilliam. Or they'll refer to them by honorifics, such as Sundim, a uh, term for sir, or Tepanim, which is basically means boss or CEO, or Sunbei, if they're a senior in a workplace or at university. They'll use the gender terms when talking to people that are closer to their rank or age group. Women talking to older women, for example, might call them Unni, which basically means older sister, but it's often used in female friendships as well. Men talking to older women would call them Nina, yeah. which is their term for older sister. However, both groups might refer to an older woman close to their mother's age as Ajumani or Ajima, or even as Omini, which means mother if they're particularly close. Men talking to older men call them Hyung, where, while women call them Oppa. Oppa, as a term I have a complicated relationship with. While meaning older brother, it is also frequently used when referring to celebrities or a significant other, or to flirt with a guy, like for example... <laughs> sort of to how people over here can call a significant other baby. I don't because it makes me feel icky, but I know that a lot of other people do. I would prefer to call older men Hyung just because it's something I'm more comfortable with. And I know that some women in South Korea do this, such as Kim Sejong, but it's very rare. <laughs> I would call a male friend Oppa. But you would never catch me dead calling someone I fancied oppa. But that's just my personal preference. There's also more of an etiquette to things, like the way you drink in front of someone depends on whether they're older or younger or more important than you. If you're the oldest member of a group of people, you're expected to behave a certain way, and same if the, you're the youngest or the magne. It affects your pace for things in a given situation, and calling each other by the honorifics can come down to even the months you were born in, unless you're very close and disregard the honorifics entirely. It makes for very interesting dynamics between characters, especially when you're first learning the language, and you know what the words mean, but seeing them applied in wider context can be like a little bit confusing. Not understanding Understanding why a character would get so angry at another character for simply asking we, which means why, until realizing that it's because they weren't close enough for him to say we, and he should have said well, because the yo part is an honorific that you use when you're among people that you respect or are older than you, etc, etc. It's the equivalent of if your boss asks you something and you respond with eh, instead of pardon? But often the subtitles don't necessarily reflect that. <laughs> so once you're more familiar with the language, you actually understand a lot more of the subtext of what is happening, which is super fun. Speaking of, five, Korean cinematography is fascinating. The evolution of K-dramas from 2006 to 2021 is fascinating. There are common tropes in dramas that go in and out of fashion, like the mean-spirited chai with a heart of gold. Thank you, boys over flowers. A few moments later. Come, Zambia. You could 
solo en el show. Or a more recent one that I hope dies soon, where the characters are separated in the last episode with no contact for up to years at a time, and then the one who left comes back, and then everything's just fine, and it's like nothing changed. It's supposed to be romantic, because like, look, he was away for so long, and she thought he was gone for, for forever, and that he died or whatever, but now he's back, and it's like nothing's different. They must be soulmates. But I spend most of that time just thinking he's a dick for having gone on contact for so long, and also it's been years, and she hasn't moved on. My God, that's a lot. Anyway, what was I talking about? Oh yeah, tropes. So there are plot tropes and character tropes that come and go, but I especially want to highlight visual tropes and cinematography because it's great. There's loads of emphasis on imagery and dynamic lighting. Take, for example, one of the best scenes in cinema history. There's always something interesting going on in frame, and they use snow a lot better than American dramas, and the editing is really interesting, and often very funny. Strong Woman Do Bong Soon has some of the most crackhead editing and sound design I have ever seen, and it's fucking incredible. 10 out of 10 would recommend. <laughs> the performances are also just bigger. Crying scenes are soul shattering, screaming, sobbing scenes that make you feel almost embarrassed to be watching them. Like they should be private. <laughs> There are dramatic punch-ins for comedic effect, musical cues, overuse of slow motion. Everything in K-drama seems to be constantly striving for bigger moments, bigger emotions, bigger audience reactions. It might seem unnatural if you've only ever grown up on Western TV, but across Asia, this slightly over-the-top performance and editing style is actually a mainstay. China, Taiwan, Thailand, they all utilize big editing choices and huge performances to carry a show, and that's honestly really engaging once you get used to it. There are also the less celebrated tropes, like, for example, as I already mentioned the dead fish cases earlier, these are often made worse in the older dramas with a long, drawn-out build-up to them. As the channel Drama Master put in a crack video once, it feels like 93,738 angles for a kiss for 2,000 years. <laughs> And then sometimes the kiss doesn't even happen. They get interrupted and it's like, my God, what was all that energy for? These long, drawn-out, multi-shot, slow-mo moments also happen with the tropey wrist grab and awkward one-sided hug scenes too. Which again, is supposed to be romantic, but oftentimes just makes it more obvious how one-sided it is. <laughs> Sometimes, however, it's utilized very effectively.
long takes and lingering on moments in general is something that K-dramas do a lot more than American or British dramas. They really like to sit in a moment, especially romantic or dramatic ones, or the cliffhanger moments at the ends of episodes. Not to use Goblin as an example again, but... Which brings me to the OSTs. K-drama OSTs fucking slap. But something that takes a minute to get used to is that they often use OSTs with lyrics in as a substitute for instrumental OSTs. So while many TV shows will use the same piece of music in dramatic moments to create an emotional association with that music for those kinds of scenes, for example, in Matt Smith's Doctor Who with this piece of music, where every time it started in the background, you knew shit was about to go down. Yeah. Trust me. Always. You don't trust me. In K-dramas, a lot of times it's using a song, which can be jarring if you're not used to it. Once you are used to it, however, those songs will live in your head rent-free until the day you die. Also, a lot more recent K-dramas are distinctly lacking in the male gaze. This might have to do with a lot of them being written by women, or just the fact that equal opportunity sexualization or lack thereof is always more fun than like long drawn out leg to boob shots are. There's almost always a shirtless scene with a guy or a shower scene of contemplation. <laughs> And the sexualization of women is often used as a power move where the women have actual agency. It's very sexy of them, actually. Nothing hotter than a woman putting on her best red dress to stick it to her rich, corrupt, garbage family at a funeral. Which actually brings me to... Six, Korean media is the foremost pioneer of anti-capitalism. Once again, I have an entire essay about this coming up, so I will keep this point short. So yeah, if you're a communist, socialist, or are otherwise exhausted with our oppressive systems of class, government, and oppressive late-stage capitalism, I have about a hundred K-dramas I could recommend to you just off the top of my head. To start with, assuming you've already seen Parasite and or Squid Game, I'd recommend Graceful Family, Rain or Shine, Gila, and Mad Dog. Graceful Family is about a woman taking her rich family down from the inside. Why don't you try? Rain or Shine is about how capitalism has abandoned the victims of a mall collapse. Gila is about journalists uncovering corruption. <laughs> And Mad Dog is about a small group of people trying to expose an insurance company for a plane crash that killed their families. <clears throat> the main villains of Mad Dog in particular are absolutely terrible people that are incredibly compelling to watch. And speaking of, Seven, the art of a villain. I have said multiple times in the last few years that I am sick and tired of how villains are written nowadays. It seems like every single show and movie has to either humanize villains to the point where you're supposed to feel bad for them and like understand their villainy, like in the case of Kylo Ren, Snape, or the Joker in the 2019 incel film, or they take a person with a totally reasonable cause to fight and then make them commit an unforgivable act in order to turn the audience against them. See the entire
entire Marvel canon. The exception to this was the Netflix Marvel TV shows, which did actually do quite a good job. Something K-dramas do exceptionally, in most cases, is write a good villain. Now this is partially linked to the fact that they're constantly critiquing capitalism and class. So the villains are invariably corrupt politicians, or bad cops, or evil billionaires, but like, they're also just compelling. It's nice to watch a show where you want to see the villain get summarily punched in his stupid face right before seeing his entire empire topple before his eyes. They're people who clawed their way to the top through underhanded means, or were born on top and used that to crush the people beneath them, or gain the system with money, or use their wealth and status to literally and figuratively get away with murder. You know, like how people do in the real world. People who we'd all like to see get taken down. So when it happens in K-dramas, it's cathartic and fun and, dare I say it, very sexy. That's not to say these villains aren't complex and interesting and morally grey, a lot of them are. But they're also clearly villains in every sense of the word. They're the kinds of people who you want to see get their comeuppance in real life, so it's extra fun to see them get it on screen. Like the villain in a Taewon class. I'm not sure I've ever wanted to punch someone that badly, which is a feat considering the actor who plays him is a delight who I've liked in everything else I've seen. <laughs> And also, they do the just evil for no reason villains really well too. One of my favourite K-dramas is The Uncanny Counter, which you can watch on Netflix, and the villain in that is literally an evil spirit that keeps possessing bad people and using their bodies to kill people. No rhyme, no reason, just wants to eat souls. It's great. 10 out of 10, no critiques. <laughs> Final thoughts! If you've never seen K-dramas before but this video made you interested, that's great! I hope some of the recommendations I made were helpful and there will definitely be more videos with Rexin down the line. If not, that's also fine! Not everybody likes the same things. And if you already loved K-dramas, I apologise for telling you things that you definitely already knew. You might have noticed that I talked about elaborating on some of these points in their own essays, and there are plenty of things that I didn't even touch on because they deserve entire videos of their own. So if you're interested in me breaking down these topics more thoroughly, or discussing my favourite K-dramas at length, or talking about things I hate in K-dramas, or anything like that, please feel free to subscribe and like hit the little the little bell thing with the ding. Like hit the little... It's like, I'm, it's like I'm a YouTuber. And if there's anything in particular that you'd like me to do a video on, please sound off in the comments. I am fully open to suggestions. I have a Google Doc full of video ideas and I'd love to add to it. In the meantime, take care of yourselves and thank you for watching. Annyeong!